I suppose we all have our sort of favorite space missions, the spacecraft crawling over Mars, they've landed on Titan, rendezvoused with comets. But for me, the Voyager mission is in a class of its own. It was launched 40 years ago and it's traveling, traveling, and it'll continue to travel long after any of us are alive, long after the human race disappeared, that will still be there. Last year, I uh, just happened to hear uh, Professor Emma Bunce on a BBC radio program, um, and she was waxing lyrical about the Voyager mission and how important it was to her personally. And I thought, if only we can get this lady to come and talk to us. And she is here tonight, and I'm delighted about that. Professor Emma Bunce is president of the Royal Astronomical Society. She's a leading expert on the gas giants and their moons and has key roles in various uh, uh, European uh, space missions. Uh, she's head of physics and astronomy at the University of Leicester, which is where she's joining us from tonight. Uh, welcome, Emma. Uh, thank you for honoring Cork Astronomy Club by agreeing to talk to us tonight. Uh, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm hoping everybody can hear me okay. Thank you so much for inviting me to come to speak to you um, this evening. It's, it's really great to be with you. Shame I can't be with you in person. Maybe another time I can come back and talk about one of the other missions that I'm working on. So thanks for the introduction, Peter. And yes, I am working as Head of School of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Leicester, which has kept me rather busy over the last year especially given the situation that we are in and also I'm very fortunate enough to be the current president of the Royal Astronomical Society so so life is pretty busy and if that wasn't enough I also work on a variety of different planetary missions in the solar system and I have worked on the Cassini mission at Saturn and I'm working on the Juno mission and the JUICE mission which will go to the Jupiter system um, and I'm working on a Mercury mission as well. But tonight I'm going to talk to you over the next half an hour or so about Voyager. So Voyager for me is a very special mission. Um, as Peter mentioned, I was talking about it on the Life Scientific. And for me, it's a number of ways really that it's a really special mission. Personally, it did three key things for me. The first is that it inspired me as a teenager when I was about 14, Voyager flew past Neptune. And I recall very vividly seeing a BBC Horizons program about the Neptune flyby. And I was pretty much blown away by the fact that it was possible that you could actually get a job um, doing something like that, really. I think that was the thing that really struck me, as well as the amazing results from that flyby. The second thing that Voyager has done for me is that it provided the data which I studied during my PhD and my PhD work was at Jupiter and then following my PhD I studied the Voyager data um, from Saturn and so that work really allowed me to you know to really get started in my career to be honest after my PhD and uh, the Voyager data at Saturn sort of allowed me to uh, make some progress with my work and make an impression on and then get involved in the Cassini magnetometer team. So it's really done a huge amount for me. So um, I'm really delighted to be able to talk to you about Voyager this evening. Okay, so as, as you've already heard, Voyager um, was a mission that was launched uh, many years ago and remarkably the two spacecraft are both still operating and I'll, and I'll talk about that at the very end of this talk. Um, but the launch was in 1977, and in fact, strangely, Voyager 2 was launched first in August, followed by Voyager 1. But actually then, uh, Voyager 1 was ahead of Voyager 2 for the planetary flybys, and, and I'll talk to you about that in a moment. What's really interesting about the Voyager mission, and, and really what makes it so historical in many ways, is that it was worked out in about 1965 that there was going to be a rare planetary alignment that would just make a tour by multiple spacecraft, actually it was more than two to begin with, a tour of the outer planets would be possible. So if you think about it from the position of launching from the Earth to head out 
in the solar system somewhere like Jupiter and then beyond to Saturn and Uranus and Neptune, what you actually need is that those planets are in the right place at the right time when your spacecraft gets there. And this rare planetary alignment was due to occur such that a launch in 1977 or 78 would take two spacecraft on this fantastic grand tour. And that planetary alignment only occurs once every 176 years, so it really was an amazing opportunity for NASA. And they were very keen to do it. Now, there were all sorts of problems, as there always are with, with um, space missions, and I won't go into those details. I'd rather talk to you about the science that was done by the spacecraft. But the two spacecraft um, went separately and were designed to do specific things. So Voyager 1 was actually designed specifically to look at Titan. So there was a decision made that the scientists wanted to study the, the moon of Saturn called Titan, which would then change the path of that spacecraft and take it out of the solar system. Okay, so once the Titan flyby was locked into the mission design, then um, Voyager 1 would go off on a different path and would not visit any other planets in the solar system. Voyager 2, on the other hand, was aimed to go past Jupiter and on to Saturn on a path that, that would then potentially take it directly to Uranus and Neptune. Well, it would definitely take it to Uranus and Neptune, but at the time of launch, it wasn't known whether there would be enough money to support the observations at Uranus and Neptune, or indeed if the instruments would still be operating. But it all worked successfully, and the mission um, occurred exactly as is shown on this diagram here. So between them, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 explored all of the giant planets in the outer solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, all of their moons and their unique system of rings and magnetic fields which the planets possess. And as of today, Voyager 1 is currently at a distance of about 22.8 billion kilometres from the Sun, about 150 astronomical units. An astronomical unit is defined as the average distance between the Earth's orbit and the Sun and is approximately 150 million kilometres. And Voyager 2 is currently at a distance of 19 billion kilometres and still operating and still communicating with the Earth, which is just incredible. OK, so this picture shows us one of the spacecraft. It doesn't really matter which one. They are identical. Um, they have exactly the same features in terms of the spacecraft bus, which contains all the key ingredients of the, the spacecraft itself and all of the instrumentation that's on board, which is going to allow the science to be done. So I was thinking about this when I was preparing this lecture, you know, it must have been really uh, interesting to think about exactly which instruments were going to be on board this spacecraft. So it's imagining you're going on a really long holiday and you're going to places that you've never been before, you've never explored before, and you don't really know how long you're going to be going for either. So what on earth are you going to pack? And this is kind of the, the sort of science equivalent of that consideration. You've got to put together a suite of instruments that are going to be able to answer the broadest science questions possible. And so Voyager 1 and 2 were identical and they each were equipped with 10 different experiments. And those different instruments included imaging cameras, infrared and ultraviolet spectrometers. At the end of the magnetometer boom, which sticks out to the left of this picture, carries the magnetic field instrument, which measures the magnetic fields of the planets and in interplanetary space and in interstellar space now. There are also instruments that measure particles, so charged particles, they're known as plasma detectors, and also cosmic ray instruments. And as well as that, you can also see there are planetary radio astronomy and plasma wave antennas which conducted radio experiments in a variety of different ways. The other important thing about Voyager, um, and really the key thing about Voyager in terms of the fact that it's still working, is that the Voyagers travelled too far from the sun to be able to use solar panels. And so instead they were equipped with power sources, which are called radioisotope thermoelectric generators, or RTGs, and you can see 
the RTG on the spacecraft here. And these devices are used on deep space missions to convert heat produced from natural radioactive decay of plutonium into electricity to power the spacecraft instruments, computers, uh, radio and, and other systems. And that's really why the spacecraft are still operating. OK, so let's get to some results because we've got a long way to go through the solar system. So here on, I'm going to be giving you some selected highlights. So I'm just really telling you about some of the things which I suppose interest me the most. I can't possibly cover everything in this short talk. So you can bear in mind that there's lots more that the Voyager missions have done. And I just wanted to mention that actually lots of the images that I'm showing you have been reprocessed and remastered by Kevin Gill. And you can find Kevin Gill on um, Flickr, on Twitter and all sorts of other social media platforms. And Kevin works at the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena and has spent a lot of time remastering the images from Voyager. And they're just incredible. So all of the images I'm going to show you, unless I tell you otherwise, I think I've got one that is not from Voyager, are all taken by the Voyager cameras. And I think that's really worth bearing in mind. You may have seen some images from Cassini, from Juno and other planetary missions. But remember that all of these images were taken by those instruments that were launched back in 1977. And I think when you keep that in mind, these images really are quite remarkable. So the Jupiter flyby was in March 1979 for Voyager 1 and July 1979 for Voyager 2. Now, as I'm sure many of you know, Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system. It's, it's a gas giant. It's, its atmosphere is mainly hydrogen and helium, and it has small amounts of methane, uh, ammonia, and water vapor and, and other compounds which give it its colorful latitudinal bands and atmospheric clouds and storms, which show us the dynamic weather systems in the atmosphere. Now, at the time of the Voyager flyby, it was known that the planet had 13 moons. We now know that Jupiter has 79 moons, so we've come quite a long way since the Voyager flybys. And it takes nearly 12 years for Jupiter to orbit around the Sun, but it rotates really quickly. So its day length is actually just under 10 hours. So it's a rapid rotating gas giant. It has the strongest magnetic field of all the planets in the solar system, which Voyager measured. And its magnetic field is tilted over with respect to its rotation axis. So its field sort of wobbles up and down as the planet rotates. So Voyager began taking pictures of Jupiter as it approached and as it left the system. And as well as taking pictures of the planet itself, it homed in on some specific targets like the Great Red Spot, which I'm just showing you on the right hand side here. So this is a collection of images taken by Voyager. And I think this is just a remarkable picture. The detail in this Great Red Spot, the complex storm raging in Jupiter's atmosphere and has been for hundreds of years, seen with so much detail in this beautiful image on the right hand side. And Voyager actually revealed a lot of the details about this complex storm moving in a counterclockwise uh, rotation and also discovered many smaller storms and features um, that were found from these first close-up images. The Voyager spacecraft with its cameras also discovered three additional moons, so took the count from 13 up to 16 during um, their flybys. Probably the most exciting discovery of the Voyager mission, especially at the Jupiter flyby, is associated with the moon Io. Io was an interesting target. It's one of the four Galilean moons of the Jupiter system. And the closest encounter between the Voyager spacecraft and Io was just 20,000 kilometres away from the moon. And you can see on the left hand side, one of the first images that were taken as the spacecraft got close to Io. I'm sure you've seen pictures of Io before and you may be familiar with what it looks like, but you have to try to imagine that you're really seeing these details for the very first time. And what we can see is a remarkable surface 
which looks like no other surface of any moon anywhere else in the solar system as, as we now know and has this sort of yellowy tinge with black spots all over it and is really quite unusual looking. And one of the things that was noticed is that there was no craters or surface features on Io. Now I'm just changing the picture there so you can see a slightly different view that Voyager took and if you've got a really good screen and you can see the picture really well you may be able to see a feature in the top right sort of somewhere around one half past one two o'clock on the limb of Io this strange feature rising up above the surface of Io so when this was first seen the scientists who were looking at these images for the first time were not expecting to discover uh, what they found what this image was showing was an active volcano and as I say I think this was easily the greatest unexpected discovery at Jupiter and it's the first time that active volcanoes have been seen on another body in the solar system. So together the voyagers actually observed the eruption of nine volcanoes on Io in their close flyby of the Jupiter system um, and I'm hoping that I can just show you a, a very quick movie so it doesn't last very long and you should just be able to see the eruptions of the volcanoes. So hopefully you can just see that coming up from the limb at two separate points. I'll just play it again. So this is actual Voyager data and you can see the dynamic eruption of volcanoes on Io. So this was a major discovery. And of course, at the time, it was thought, why does Io have active volcanoes? And it's thought to be due to the heating of the satellite by tidal forces. And Io is actually perturbed in its orbit by um, the other Galilean moons, Europa and Ganymede. And it's sort of pushed and pulled by Jupiter and the other Galilean satellites such that its interior is heated and its surface actually moves as the tidal bulge by nearly 100 metres. And there's a little close up uh, of the volcano you can see there from those first images. And amazingly, it turns out that these active volcanoes on Io actually have a significant impact on the space environment of Jupiter. And this is where this sort of leads into my PhD work. So if you just indulge me for, for a couple of minutes whilst I tell you about some of the work that I did for my PhD. So that volcanism on Io actually affects the whole system. And because it is the primary source of matter that is being produced into the local space environment of the planet Jupiter. So the region of space that surrounds the planet, which is influenced by the Jupiter magnetic field, is known as a magnetosphere. And that's what the diagram on the right hand side is showing. So Jupiter is the black dot right at the centre. And then the white lines are showing the magnetic field lines coming out from the interior of the planet. And so these volcanoes are actually producing sulfur and oxygen and sodium atoms, which are then being sort of produced into this space environment. And those neutral particles actually end up becoming ionized. And so they become charged particles, ions, sulfur ions, oxygen and sodium ions, and also electrons. And once they are ionized and charged, they sense the magnetic field of Jupiter and that magnetic field of Jupiter is rotating around with the planet in approximately once every 10 hours. What I did for my PhD work was actually look at the effects that Io has on the system by producing all of this plasma. It turns out to be about a tonne per second of material that's being dumped into Jupiter's magnetic field and it turns out that as Jupiter's magnetic field rotates around and gathers up all of this plasma, it actually turns out that it slows the magnetic field down. It essentially gets weighed down with plasma and can't keep up with the planet's 10 hour rotation rate. And what happens then is this diagram on the, on the left is showing is that the magnetic field lines end up getting distorted. And if you bend a magnetic field line, if you change the magnetic field, you generate an electric current that then flows between the plane containing Io 
and the upper atmosphere. And that's what the dashed lines are showing in this diagram. So that's actually an electric current which is flowing between Io and Jupiter's upper atmosphere. And what that actually does is create an emission, an aurora in Jupiter's upper atmosphere. So on the right hand side, this is my image that's not from Voyager, this is the Hubble Space Telescope image that shows the Io footprint on the left and the main auroral oval, both of which are a direct consequence of the active volcanoes on Io. So that's pretty amazing. So Voyager also took pictures and flew relatively close to Europa and Ganymede and Callisto, the other Galilean moons, and discovered other interesting features. So, for example, it was the first close-up look at Europa, where we saw the linear features on the otherwise very smooth, bright surface on Europa. Again, a very different looking moon to any other moon that had been encountered before. And at first, it was thought that the features could be deep cracks that were caused by tectonic processes, but further features indicated that it was a possibility uh, that they could be due to tidal heating and the flexing of Europa's surface. And of course, we now think we understand that underneath that icy surface, there is a global ocean. And of course, these images have inspired future missions. Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system. It's actually bigger than the planet Mercury. And the first images from Voyager showed um, a heavily cratered and grooved terrain, unlike any other surface that we've seen, again, anywhere else. And on the right hand side, you can see Callisto. Um, and hopefully you can just make out a feature, um, which is a very large impact crater called Valhalla. And it has multiple concentric rings coming out from the impact point. Um, and Valhalla is at the largest impact crater in the solar system. So this flyby of Jupiter and the moons inspired the Galileo mission in the 1990s and now has inspired two missions that are going to be launched next year. One is Europa Clipper to go to study Europa in further detail and the Jupiter icy moons explorer to uh, focus on Ganymede. OK, so swiftly moving out through the solar system, then we get to Saturn and Voyager 1 and 2 arrived at Saturn late in 1980 and in the middle of 1981. And so Saturn is the second largest planet in the solar system. It's approximately twice as far away as Jupiter is compared to the Earth. So it takes nearly 30 years to orbit uh, around the sun and its rotation rate was actually measured for the first time uh, by Voyager, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, and its rotation rate was clocked at 10 hours and 39 minutes. So again, a very rapidly rotating gas giant planet. A question for the audience, which you can think about and, and tell me the answer at the end, is actually how do you measure the rotation rate of a gas giant planet? It turns out that the Voyager measurements did not agree with those made when Cassini was approaching Saturn and so it actually turns out to be much more complex than we had ever thought. So again at the time of the Voyager missions um, it was known that Saturn had 17 moons and obviously it's famous for its ring system which can be seen from telescopes and again Saturn is mostly hydrogen and helium and what Voyager discovered and found in further detail compared to Earth-based observations was again broad atmospheric banding that was similar to Jupiter um, but not with the same colour variation that you see at Jupiter. And Voyager also measured Saturn's magnetic field which interestingly is more similar to the Earth's magnetic field in strength that is much weaker than Jupiter's magnetic field but it's highly axisymmetric, which means that its magnetic field is very closely aligned to the rotation axis of the planet, unlike Jupiter, and really, as we now know, unlike any other planet in the solar system. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the real focuses of the mission, the Voyager 1 specifically, was the flyby of Titan. So Saturn's largest moon, again, bigger than the planet Mercury. It had long been known to have an atmosphere 
and this is what you can see in this beautiful image taken by Voyager in the thick atmosphere which means you cannot see the surface of Titan with visible imaging. What Voyager was able to do on this close flyby that was targeted to pass just behind Titan as seen from the Earth and the Sun and actually the spacecraft approach to, to Titan within about 7,000 kilometres and Voyager was then able to use its instruments to measure the atmosphere composition, its density and its pressure, and also to measure the mass of Titan using the radio instrument and the effect of Titan itself on the Voyager trajectory as it flew past. And so these amazing measurements were made of Titan, which then was a key target for the mission and then was a huge influence and almost work was started almost immediately to define uh, the Cassini mission, which was then to go to Saturn and Titan. Now, this is an image of Enceladus, which is one of the smaller moons of Saturn. It's about 500 kilometers across. Enceladus is uh, a very unusual surface and Voyager discovered it was extremely bright, which indicates perhaps that relatively young replenished surface and that it was marked by faults and valleys and did not have as many impact craters um, as other moons in the Saturn system have. So it was indicating that there could be some geologic activity. If you follow the Cassini mission, you'll know that Cassini discovered active geysers spewing water ice from uh, what we now know is a global ocean underneath the icy crust. OK, so moving on out to the Voyager 2 encounters with Uranus into totally uncharted territory now. As you'll know, Uranus is, is more difficult to observe from the Earth using telescopes. And so Voyager 2 really sent back the very first detailed images of the Uranus system, including this incredible image of the planet. Uranus orbits, again, about twice as far away as Saturn. So it takes around 84 years to orbit around the sun. But again, the length of the day, which was measured by Voyager, is just 17 hours. So again, they're all rapidly rotating gas giants. Now, one of the really interesting features of Uranus is that it is tipped on its side. So its rotation axis is actually tipped over by 90 degrees compared to the rest of the planets. And this is very unusual um, and it involves the planet rolling along its orbit rather than rotating around like the other planets. And it's thought that it's a result of a collision early in the solar system history. Voyager studied um, the ring system of Uranus. So you can see an image there with the visible ring system on its side. So it looks like a bullseye because of this rotation rate that is tipped over by 90 degrees and Voyager studied the rings that were already known about and discovered two new rings. The other thing which Voyager discovered about Uranus was about its magnetic field, which had never previously been measured because it's the first spacecraft to go close by. So you can see on the right hand side, the rotation axis tipped over by 90 degrees, and then the magnetic axis is then tilted at, a, at 60 degrees to the rotation axis. So it's this very unusual situation and Voyager 2 found that one of the most striking influences of that sideways position was felt um, in the magnetic field and the magnetosphere as the planet rolls along in its orbit rotating every 17 hours the magnetic tail the magnetosphere tail is actually wound up like a corkscrew into a very complex configuration so here's a little picture postcard of some of the moons of Uranus and Voyager actually discovered 10 new moons bringing the total number to 15 and the new moons which were discovered were really quite small in diameter around 150 kilometers or so uh, obviously difficult to observe from the earth and then the larger moons you can see here and um, just to point out a couple of features, Miranda is the innermost of the five large moons, is a very strange surface indeed, and has deep canyons that are 20 kilometers deep and has a mixture of old and young surfaces. 
and it's thought that Miranda could be a kind of re-aggregation of material from an earlier time when the moon may have been fractured by a giant impact that tore it apart. So these are the best images that we have of the Uranus system and we've yet to have a mission go back to that system. Okay, so moving on to Neptune, and these images really do take me back to when I was first watching this on the Horizon program. Um, so the voyage of two flybys in August of 1989. And I distinctly remember going out and buying an astronomy magazine with all the pictures of Neptune in it, and then creating a project for school, a science project that I had to do. And I just made it all about Neptune because I was just so amazed by these incredible images that were coming back. So the first close-up images of this incredible planet. Neptune is the smallest of the gas giants and it takes 165 years to orbit around the sun. And again, it's a rapidly rotating gas giant, so it has a 16 hour day. But bearing in mind how far away from the sun it actually was, the Voyager results were surprising. They showed several large dark spots. You can see one actually in this central bright blue image here, reminiscent of the hurricane-like storms in Jupiter's atmosphere. So like the great red spot on Jupiter, this was dubbed the great dark spot and is about the size of planet Earth. Neptune's atmosphere, as you can see here, is, is really quite dynamic and interesting. Voyager also measured some of the strongest winds observed on any planet. Finally, on the right hand side, you can see the little diagram of the magnetic field of Neptune. And again, similar to Uranus, Voyager discovered the magnetic field of Neptune, measured it for the first time, and again found that it was highly tilted compared to the rotation axis. So Uranus and Neptune are similar in terms of their magnetic fields and rather different to um, the other planets which we've measured magnetic fields of in the solar system. Now, one of the really exciting features of the Neptune flyby was the first observations of the moon Triton. So this is the largest of the moons of Neptune and is the most intriguing satellite in the system and, and one of the most interesting in all of the solar system. So the images from Voyager showed evidence of remarkable geologic history and it's thought that Voyager 2 images show active geyser-like eruptions spewing invisible nitrogen gas and dust particles several kilometres into the atmosphere. So if you can see these dark features on the surface, that is thought to be the um, geyser-like eruptions. So Triton has um, the coldest surface in the solar system. It's minus 235 degrees Celsius, and it has a crust of frozen nitrogen. And in terms of what's underneath the icy surface of Triton is something which we would really like to know and of course will require a future mission to study this Neptune system and Triton in more detail. Okay so just to finish up then as I've mentioned at the beginning the missions are still going and so once Voyager 2 had finished its mission at Uranus and Neptune so by around 1990 the Voyager interstellar mission began. This part of the mission really was to have a look at the heliosphere, which is the bubble around the sun created by the outward flow of the solar wind from the sun and the opposing inward flow of the interstellar wind. So the spacecraft carried on and made the first and really remarkable measurements as the spacecraft moved throughout this heliosphere. So in the same way that I described the space environment around Jupiter, as being controlled by Jupiter's magnetic field, the heliosphere is the region surrounding the sun and contains the sun's plasma and magnetic field moving out past all the planets in the solar system. So it's essentially like a giant magnetosphere, but it's the sun's magnetic field which controls this region of space. Remarkably, both spacecraft continue to operate and have measured the outer boundaries of this heliosphere. So Voyager 1 
crossed through the outer regions, the heliopause at 121 astronomical units, and Voyager 2 passed through at a different point after its trajectory changed and went down underneath the ecliptic plane and measured the boundaries of this heliosphere at 122 AU. So there were lots of features that we were anticipating in terms of how we would know that the spacecraft had got to the boundary in terms of the plasma measurements and the rate of cosmic rays. Um, so the measurements of cosmic rays increases sharply as you exit through the heliosphere. OK, so that's the incredible journey of Voyager 1 and 2 throughout the solar system. And just to finish up, I just wanted to mention future exploration. So Voyager has inspired many further missions uh, which have already travelled throughout the solar system to places like Saturn and Jupiter, but no spacecraft has yet to go uh, for a dedicated mission to Uranus and Neptune, no orbiters of those planets. And so both the European Space Agency and NASA are studying the possibility of future missions to Uranus and Neptune and we very much hope that we will commit to those missions in the next few years and interestingly there's also a new NASA funded study for an interstellar probe to actually go um, throughout the heliosphere and actually be a dedicated mission to study the space between the stars, so beyond our heliosphere and studying interstellar space. Okay, so I shall leave it there. Thank you very much for listening. Emma, thanks. Uh, you kind of finished where uh, I get most intrigued and I'm just gonna abuse my position as host of this meeting by asking you a question. And that is, you mentioned at the very beginning that at least one of the voyagers is still communicating with Earth. I yes. find this incredible. I don't, don't even know how it's possible. I mean, <laughs> 1977 technology, for heaven's sake, I mean, how is it done and what, what kind of information comes back or does any useful information come back? Oh, absolutely. Um, um, so Voyager 2 has five instruments which are still operating. So the magnetic field instrument, two of the energetic particle instruments and two lower energy particle instruments as well. So actually particle instruments have survived incredibly well considering that at least one of them has a moving part. So that may blow your mind even further because it has a it has a, a, a wheel that moves within it. So anything that has a moving part that can operate for that long is, is really quite remarkable. But in terms of the actual communications it's really quite interesting because the antenna on both spacecraft obviously has to be pointed back to the Earth in order, in order to get the information back. And so it's through the deep space network, which is the main way of communicating with, with many interplanetary missions, so like Cassini or Juno. Um, and every now and again, the deep space network will connect up with Voyager 1 or Voyager 2 and will just listen out and collect data coming back from those spacecraft. Now the limiting factor in terms of how long can they go on, that really is, is going back to this um, RTG that I mentioned towards the beginning and, and how much power the spacecraft has, how long can it keep going. Um, the estimate is possibly they could keep going until about 2025 and still have just enough power to operate the instrument. So it's about operating the instruments and about getting that data back to the earth but yeah they're both still working and still calling home from time to time that's truly amazing now linda are you going to call some questions yeah i'm uh, just looking here um michael mccreary could io break up and become a ring around jupiter it could have done um i think there's there's certainly evidence that um, some of the rings around, let's say, Saturn, or actually particularly more like the rings around Uranus and Neptune, are, li are perhaps likely to be moons that have been pulled apart or impacted by other large objects. So 
So if IO has survived long, it's unlikely that it will happen now because the large um, stray material that was, was left over after planet formation, so after the solar system formed, um, if it didn't get pulled apart in that process, um, then it's probably reasonably safe. Um, but obviously with its volcanic eruptions, it, it, it is actually erupting a lot of its material. Um, I think I mentioned it was around a ton per second, but but even even with that, um, we don't need to be concerned. Um, IO is is very unlikely to be going anywhere um, anytime soon. But other other moons may well have been destroyed earlier in in the solar system um, formation process and and created some of the ring material that we see. And in fact, that's one of the really sort of fundamental things that we want to study when we're when we're visiting uh, planets that have ring systems like Saturn. Okay. Um, the next one we have is from Betty Hicks. Are any of the planetary rotations slowing down like the Earth's rotation in our Earth moon system? Oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, so for the reasons that, yeah, I guess, um, there could be very small changes. Um, it very much depends on the scale of uh, the system, the moons that are present, the scale of the planet, for example. Um, but maybe, maybe this gives you, me an opportunity to tell you about Saturn's rotation rate, because that was one of the, one of the really uh, perplexing features um, that turned out to be helped by, first of all, the Voyager measurement of the Saturn rotation rate. And for those of you that may have been thinking about how you measure the rotation rate of a gas giant, um, the, the answer uh, relates to the magnetic field. You actually measure the rotation rate of a gas giant planet by observing um, by observing radio emissions from particles that are trapped on magnetic field lines in the planet's uh, vicinity. So the planet has its own magnetic field, particles are trapped on the magnetic field lines and are actually sort of wandering north and south and they emit radio emission as they um, spiral around the magnetic field. And you can measure um, it's very directional, the radio emission. So when it's pointing towards you, you get a strong signal. When it's pointing away, you get a weaker signal. So in the case of Jupiter, um, the magnetic axis is tilted by 10 degrees. And so sometimes you have the radio emission from these particles on the field line, just at the right point, you get a maximum in your signal and, and then it rotates around and you get like a ticking clock of this radio emission coming from Jupiter. And that tells you accurately the rotation rate of the planet. Voyager measured the same radio emissions at Saturn. And as I mentioned, 10 hours and, and whatever it was, 39 minutes, um, Voyager measured. But then when Cassini arrived at the Saturn system, it measured a different rotation rate. Um, so different by a significant number of minutes by an amount that was, as, as we thought, as we put it at the time, quite worrying, um, would have implied that Saturn had slowed down by many minutes, like six or seven minutes, which is, which is incredibly unlikely. Um, and also I mentioned that, that Saturn's magnetic field is, is very symmetric with its rotation axis. And so, in fact, um, that apparent slowing of Saturn's rotation rate really actually in the long run just told us that we didn't really know what Saturn's rotation rate was at all. And we have then spent the rest of the Cassini mission trying to understand uh, those observations. So it took about another 13 years um, for people to understand what that was really telling us. So um, Saturn hasn't slowed down. We don't need to worry about that. Um, but we really understood something for the first time, we thought we knew how to measure the rotation rate of Saturn from the radio emissions, which Voyager did, but Cassini showed that that wasn't what we were measuring at all. Um, so yes, just to add to the complexities of planetary science. 
That's great. I'll ask you the next question. <laughs> I must say, I'm, I really enjoy it. I, I found Voyager very, very interesting. I'm a bit older than you, so I can remember a lot, a lot of more about it, a lot of all the, the big things going on, but I really, really enjoyed it. Oh, thank, thank you. you so much. Um, the next question is from John Roach. Were the Voyager team very concerned about the missions traveling through the Kuiper Belt? Oh, okay, so um, I guess the Voyager team, it, it would be the sort of problem that you'd be happy to have, I think I would say. Um, you know, to, to have the expectation that it would get that far um, would, be quite, would be quite something. And I think, you know, you'd just sort of take it on the chin uh, what may happen. That certainly wasn't part of the plan for the mission. The initial plan for the mission was, was focused on the Jupiter and Saturn flybys um, and with a real hope that there would be enough actually really funding it usually comes down to money doesn't it um, enough funding to support observations at Uranus and Neptune which was successful and then um, traveling on outwards um, for as long as we possibly can keep talking to those missions so um, I think it's it's probably unlikely that the mission will continue to um to to reach any any other objects <laughs> um it may prove me wrong but no i don't think so and i don't think the images are working so we would we would never know <laughs> regina asks the question are the voyagers being directed uh where to go at this time uh, from the control center on earth um good question uh no no they're just going <laughs> they're just on their path um there would be no way to change their direction of travel at this stage. So um, as the picture that I showed right at the beginning really depicted the trajectory was, or the mission was possible because of this fairly unusual uh, planetary alignment. And then at each point that the, that the spacecraft fly past those planets, so at Jupiter and then Saturn, you can actually use the planet itself um, in something called a gravity assist, and that can actually um, change the spacecraft uh, velocity vector, so its, it's <laughs> speed um, and direction, um, and give it a boost out to the next object. So you can use the planets themselves to actually uh, direct your spacecraft onto its next destination. But of course, once they had um, move past their final target so so Saturn in the case of Voyager or Titan in the case of Voyager 1 and Neptune in the case of Voyager 2 that's it they're on that path going at that speed um, which is pretty rapid uh, for for evermore um, um, and and that's that is that okay thank you um, Colum asks the question which of the least explored moons in our solar system uh, do you think deserves much more attention from NASA and other space agencies? Oh, this is a great question. This is the sort of question I ask my students. <laughs> so I'd like to know, I'd like to know what, the, what the person who asked the question thinks as well. Um, what do I think? Gosh, so we are very fortunate to have a mission going to Europa and to Ganymede which will be incredible because both of them are thought to have subsurface oceans and you know the potential for new science is, is absolutely huge. Um, we have had extensive studies from Cassini in the Saturn system so I think I would say I think Triton in the Neptune system is definitely one which which really deserves um, focused attention because there are these sort of tantalizing suggestions from the Voyager data that there could be uh, geological activity on that moon. It could be similar to Enceladus, which is behind me, by the way. Um, and, you know, we now know there are active geysers on Enceladus producing water ice uh, into the Saturn system. And there are, there are suggestions, as I mentioned, from Voyager that, that Triton could have an equivalent process so that would be really interesting to study okay you spoke about the rotational 
speed of planets earlier on, uh, Joe was asking, was the Earth spinning much faster originally? So the Earth's rotation rate is very slowly slowing down. So um, it, it will have been um, quicker previously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's the effect of the moon, isn't it, is actually causing it to slow down the tidal effects. Yeah, it's, it's very complex. It's very complex maths. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, David Livingstone wants to know, do we know the size of the impactor which caused Valhalla crater on Callisto? I can't do it in my head, I'm afraid. But yes, I'm sure you can, you can do an estimate. I'm actually doing a project about this with some third year undergraduates at the moment. You can actually do, you can get an estimate between the diameter of an impact crater and the kinetic energy of the impactor. Um, and there's a sort of scaling relationship between the two, which is, you know, approximate. Um, but Val, so, so you can, in theory, I can't, as I say, I can't do it in head. I don't have a calculator to hand. But um, Valhalla is, is an impact basin. So it, it has, um, it has a, a, a center point that you can see where the, where the impactor would have, would have hit the surface of Callisto. And then you can see multiple rings as, because that would have been such a significant impact. Um, so let me just think Callisto's diameter is larger than Mercury. I think Valhalla takes up maybe two thirds of the of the disc size of Callisto itself. So it's it's a significant size compared to Callisto. So it would have been, um, like I say, I can't estimate the size of the impactor. It will have been hundreds of kilometers itself as a, as a guess. Um, and it would have been close to, um, you know, catastrophic for Callisto. Uh, John Walsh, who's uh, very involved in our uh, special interest group in radio astronomy, asks, can radio Jove readings be used to measure Jupiter's rotation or rate? John thinks it might be a nice club experiment of so. Oh, do you know, I, I have, I, I do know a little bit about this, but Jupiter is a, a vast source of radio emissions. So there are lots of different frequencies and I'm not sure that the frequency is in the right range. That's the short answer. Okay. But if you want to get in touch with me, um, we can follow up um, on that. I have a feeling it's not the right frequency range that is the, um, the radio emission that, that tells you the rotation rate. Um, there are lots of other radio emissions at Jupiter. Okay. That's, a, that's a very kind offer, Emma, that we yeah, should be in touch with. Yeah, feel free. Think, think, before I hand back to you, Peter, um, there's a comment there from Ted Heubach, which, which reckons they're a bit like the Volkswagen VW. They just keep going and going and going. <laughs> but again, he is from Germany and he is a VW fan, so he might be just slightly biased. <laughs> Brilliant. Emma, I'm afraid I've kept you here slightly longer than I promised to. Uh, we're extremely grateful to you. And it, it's one of the, one of the very few uh, benefits of this lockdown uh, that we can get eminent scientists such as yourself to come and talk to our small club. Um, there, there was just a couple of questions uh, that you can maybe ask very quickly. Steve asks, is there a, is there a life-size model somewhere of maybe some museum in the United States of, uh, of Voyager where, where we could go and look when things go back to normal. Oh, yes. Now, I don't know if it's, if it's the full scale, um, but the Smithsonian uh, in Washington, D.C., um, if you have not, if you've, well, if you've been there, then you'll know it's incredible. Um, but yes, there are scale models of, of lots of uh, spacecraft there. So um, there's a Voyager, I think, as you walk in, in the in the atrium sort of hanging up above you um which is which is quite incredible we must bend our steps so and, and the, the other quick question is how long will it be before voyager is halfway between the sun and some other star 
Oh, there's a question. Um, I'd have to. I, I need. I'd need to work it out. I know the speed they're travelling, um, so we can we can do the calculation. I'll set it to you for your homework, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. Well, um, uh, Emma, uh, thank you so much for um, uh, joining us tonight. Uh, we do appreciate it, uh, and uh, I'm acutely aware of the fact that, in fact, you've probably been. Uh, having numerous Zoom lectures today already, and I've now kept you going until 20 past nine, and I did promise that uh, I wouldn't keep you longer than quarter past. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Emma, on behalf of the Astronomy Club, on behalf of everyone who has uh, uh, attended tonight. We really do appreciate being able to hear uh, directly from an expert like yourself, and it, it'll be a day that many of us will remember for a long time, believe you me.